my name is Melanie Arujo, and uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Mel Arujo. Um, I'm a product designer at uh, Young & Co, which is a product design firm here in San Francisco. I'm also a design mentor at uh, Co 2040's Entrepreneur in Residence program. And previous to that, I found an organization called uh, Front and Center, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight. And um, before that, I was a product designer at Aero, spent some time at Honor on the brand team, and then I was a lead interaction designer at Honor. Okay. So tonight, I want to talk about identities. And lately, and lately, I've been thinking a lot about my identity as a designer. Um, and defining our identity is incredibly hard, especially uh, defining our identities as designers. So typically, when I meet a new designer, usually, you know, they introduce themselves by uh, their title, their position, the company that they work for, and the work that they do. And when we define ourselves, by our work instead of our thoughts, um, we kind of let the environment that we design in define who we are. And so this creates like a lot of questions for me. And as designers, we enjoy creating things for people and sharing those uh, designs out in, with the world, right? And we hope that our designs will have a positive impact on the people that we're designing for and the users that we're designing for. And, um, and we hope that they have good contribution, they make good contribution to society. However, how do we really know what's best? Um, you know, sure, we can do user interviews to understand the context for which our solutions would live within, and we can also do usability studies to see how well our solutions work. But how well do we really understand the day-to-day -day experience of the users and the people that we're designing for? And so, Design processes are cultural. And what I mean by that is through my work with Front and Center, um, I've encountered a lot of different design cultures and company cultures, and all of them have unique characteristics and factors and traits that spill over into their design processes and how they actually design products for people. And this makes it, this makes it my job of helping people break into tech through design, people of color we're talking about here, incredibly hard because when we ask someone what makes someone a good designer, it's totally subjective and it's totally dependent on the company culture and what that, what the design team and the company values there. And most designers, if you know, if they value making a shit ton of money, awesome, versus someone who is embarking on a journey to change the world through design. So you can imagine the, the answers would be different there. And so post-election, um, I've noticed an interesting shift in the conversation with other product designers that I'm having. Um, there's a shift, there's been a shift from, we know we're not talking so much about the tools or what's, you know, what's the best prototyping tool? Should I use Marvel or a Marvel or a Framer? Instead, I see the conversation moving towards the foundations of being a good designer, like questions like this, like, does my design enforce implicit bias? Um, does my design prioritize revenue over ethics? And does my design eliminate jobs? And if, if so, whose jobs? And ultimately, what I'm trying to get to is what are, what are our responsibilities as designers? And are we responsible for the outcome of our design decisions if we're operating under the direction of our teams and companies? And so when I decided to switch career from neuroscience to design, um, it was really hard for me to take on this new identity of being a designer, you know, um, for two reasons. One, the community that I come from, they don't know what design is and they don't value design. And second, there's not a lot of black women designers in tech. So I don't really know if I'm gonna be successful switching into a field that um, I, was, I was doing okay in. Um, and so when I got started, this is what a designer looked like to me. Someone who was wearing a beanie, a white dude in t-shirt, uh, standing in front of what looks like to be a wall that's painted uh, in whiteboard paint. And so he's drawing a user flow here. And so that's what I had in my mind of what a good designer looked like. 
um, someone who really focused on their craft and just kind of did their work. But along the way, I met some really great designers that um, helped to evolve my understanding and uh, perspective on what it means to be a good designer. And good designers ask a lot of questions. They ask a lot of questions. However, the ability to ask to question the world around you is a privilege that um, some people have and others don't have. And when I apply this to my own life, I grew up in a community uh, where questioning my teachers, uh, my parents, even uh, authoritative figures on the streets, it was kind of seen as talking back or um, disrespectful and rude. So I was very timid in terms of asking questions. And so here I am as a young designer a couple years ago, uh, kind of suffering an identity crisis. And I'm like, okay, crap, I'm assuming this new identity, but now I have to also learn this new way of operating, which was completely contrast from how I grew up in a culture where you just didn't question, question things. You just did what you told and that's what it was. But here in Silicon Valley, it's one of the traits that we value the most in designers. So. Asking question is super important to becoming a great designer, and I have to learn certain behaviors to be successful in this field. And that has led me to believe that in order to get more people of color in tech, uh, spe specifically women of color uh, in tech and in, in the design field, we have to create spaces where it's okay to ask questions. That it's super obvious, but it's something that um, we just don't think about. We just assume that everyone is comfortable asking questions. And when we don't look at, um, you know, and, and, and try to understand the culture in which our peers come from, we make stupid design decisions. So proactively creating an environment where questions can be asked is the first step in um, building empathy. And one of the things that I encounter often and have trouble with still today is speaking up and asking questions about why certain things are the way they are, you know, and simply because I wasn't taught to ask those things. And, you know, most people in tech are open to answering questions, but what are we doing proactively to create that space to allow for questions to happen? And when we don't create those space, people feel isolated. They feel like they're on the outside and we're already on the outsider because we're techies. And so like, at least for me, a lot of my friends, they think I'm sellouts. So I'm a sellout. And so I'm like, okay, I don't fit in in this tech world and I don't fit in with my friends. So where do I fit in? Uh, and despite the friendly day-to-day -day interactions, you know, you might not still, some, you know, some designers of colors might not still understand the basic processes of design of how, you know, but they, outside of their regular workflow. Um, so all of this ties into my work at Front and Center. In a nutshell, Front and Center is an organization that I started um, last year after I quit my job at Telenav to help get more people of color in tech through design, and specifically by teaching them basic product design skills. And so I'm not gonna, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna really get into the first reason as to why um, I started this program. I mean, tech fucking sucks at diversity, like around the board, off, everywhere, just sucks. And so, and I'm not gonna dive too deep into that, but what I do wanna dive deep in is the fact that there's a crap ton of amazing creators of color out there and no one's reaching out to them. No one's asked, talking to them about tech or the opportunities that they have in tech as creators. And so, and most of them, are autodidactic folks. So they're like folks who figured out alternative ways to get to where we all are today. However, without the privilege that most of us have in this room today. And so what I did specifically was I worked with these companies here to identify a minimal requirement uh, of skill set required to break into tech as a designer. And what I came up with was a really simple program. Um, that I ran out of my apartment in San Francisco. Um, many, many of 
my, much of this program was basically like free classes and introductions to product design skills. So they learned how to wireframe, design user flows, and uh, prototype. And some some of them, you know, this once this is a student artwork from one of the iconography and illustration class. And but one of the things I wanted to one thing that I wanted to point out was that most of these people weren't necessarily creative. They were just people looking to transfer skills. They were people who were looking to learn more about product design because they had no idea that design and tech even exist or there was a place for them in, um, in tech. The truth is, as much as I learned, as much as they learned from me, I also learned a crap ton from them, you know? Uh, this is something that we often underestimate uh, and tonight we've heard this theme quite a bit, but we've underestimated our power to transfer knowledge and transferring knowledge in a way that it becomes a change agent, an agent of change. And when we open ourselves up and to ask questions and create spaces where questions can happen, really cool, awesome things happen. Um, and people, and through transferring of knowledge, people become happier. They become much more committed to the things that they're working on together. We build, bridges, we build bridges, we bridge knowledge gaps, and we build richer experiences for our customers and users. To wrap all of this up, um, I hope I was able to generate a few uh, questions about your own identity as designers. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is that our experiences define us as a designers. As designers, um, they shape our perspective. They um, inform the way in which we make design decisions. They um, also influence the way that we operate within the world and how we navigate planet Earth as humans. But they might not always be the best lens for approaching a problem. And that's because your experience can help you but also limit you. In my case, um, there's only a few designers in Silicon Valley that look like me and have my experience, and that's an advantage to me. But at the same time, the whole thing with questioning, that limits me. And the same could be said on the other side. There's a lot of privileged designers in Silicon Valley with you know, some of the best intentions. However, they might not necessarily have the right background to solve a, a specific problem. Um, and if I learn one thing, over the last few years of running front and center is that we have to critique the way in which we design as much as what as much as we critique what we design. Um, and you know we can't we should not be complacent in our design processes. Just because we know they work doesn't necessarily mean that they lead always to the right solution. Um, our approaches should be as unique as the problems that we're trying to solve. And um, this is one last final thought that I want to leave you guys with is, as a designer right now in Silicon Valley, we have all the freedom in the world and all the liberties to design whatever the hell we want and build whatever we want. And we should use that power to design things that work for everyone, not just for some. Um, thoughtful thinkers, they think things through. So um, with that, I want to thank you guys for having me and have a great holiday.